All righty then, well, maybe we give it a kick off because we're about five minutes past two. Um, and we'll start with Emmanuel, as I said earlier. So this is a webinar all about advances in automated irrigation and efficiency. I'll just make sure that, there we go. Um, you measure Burlington berries in Tasmania. There you go. Beautiful spot. Um, so the speakers, as I said, is going to be Emmanuel Corello from Osberries. Emmanuel is in Victoria. Um, Jeremy Giddings from Agriculture Victoria. Um, he's the regional manager for irrigation. And Andreas Jaramillo, sorry if I'm saying that incorrectly, <laughs> from Irrigation Australia. So I am going to bring up a series of videos that um, Emmanuel pre-recorded for us. Um, and Emmanuel's going to take us through his automatic irrigation system on his farm, which, um, oh, there we go, hang on. There we go. So Emmanuel, perhaps um, we'll just let the video roll. Each video is only three or four minutes and then um, we can ask, uh, answer questions at the end. So if you've got questions as the video is going, just pop them in the chat box and Emmanuel can uh, read them and then answer them at the end. All right, so let's hit play. Roller. We opted for a, a, a digital controller. You can get analog ones as well, which are simpler. This is just, this has, the difference with this is, is via this Wi-Fi module, I can see what's happening here with my programs. This is how I program irrigation. I can see everything on that on my phone. So I can alter programs and um, turn programs on and off from my phone, from my computer, or from here. So I can do this if I'm at home, I can, and I feel that, um, for instance, I might need to give everything a round of 15 minutes, I just press go. Anyway, I can, I mean, I can do it from overseas if I want to. Um, I've got programs that work on time. Um, so I can set this and it will turn the pump on and, and water at night, or if I'm off for a week or whatever I need to do, I can set the program because the time's already in, in and the date's already in the controller for up to two weeks. So it works on a two week cycle. Um, you can have 32 different programs. You can copy them, um, you can alter them, same as from the phone. So if I, for instance, group one is not operating because that's not planted at the moment in this program, so I've just deleted it. You can you can fertigate. So if I wanted to, for instance, my fertigation program, which is exactly the same, has chemical. Um, you can notice that the block's running for 20 minutes, but the chemical's only running for 18. So it, it runs for a minute before it turns the fertigation pump on, and the fertigation pump shuts down a minute before the block turns off, so you flush through. Um, you can set that all up and control it all from here. You can control with fertigation, you can control um, as many chemicals as you want. You just allocate them a station and it turns them on. Um, I only got one pump, which is down there, and it's a diesel pump. I've got an auto start module on the diesel pump um, and variable speed, dri uh, variable speed drive. The pump is part of the system? Yes, the pump, well, the pump is down there, but this controls the pump. This turns it on and off. So... If I press a program to go or I set a program to go on by itself, the pump turns on, warms up, gets up to speed and pressure, hmm. waters the whole farm, and then when it's done, it turns itself off. Did you have to upgrade your pump? Only the controller. So I found a company that, um, that do variable speed drives for diesel engines. You just give them the model, they give you a whole controller, wiring loom, everything ready to go on it. It sounds really easy. Well, it's not easy, but... It's well, not that it sounds, hard either. Sounds great. <clears throat> Any auto electric will be able to, to hook that up to your diesel pump. All right. Thanks okay. for that, Emmanuel. Um, I've just popped in the chat box. Yeah. Today. Perhaps if you could just share with everybody. Um, How long I've been using it? Two, yes. um, two seasons. Okay. And, um, you know, is there a particular reason that you went with this model or this brand or this? Um, not particularly. Um, so I had the Toro rep come up. Um, I, I liked 
the functionality of it, it did what I needed to do. Mm-hmm. Um, the guy that makes them in South Australia was really helpful as well. And actually they don't make them for Toro anymore, but I still have a reasonable relationship with him. If there's any technical issues, he's quick to respond and has sorted everything out, you know, when I've needed it. So um, yeah, I, I wanted the functionality that I can control it remotely. Okay. So that was the most important thing for me. Okay. No props. Just because I, I, it's, it's handy because if you're away and things change or, you know, you forget something, it, it's, it's easy to, it's easy to do. Say you get home and you forget to put the program on or something, you don't have to go back mm-hmm. and stuff. And I don't live that close to the farm. So, I, you know, half an hour drive. So yep. it's just better for me. All right. If there's no other questions, I might move on to the next video then. That's okay with everyone. Um, what kind of crop are you going? Good question. Strawberries. Just strawberries? Just strawberries. There you go, just strawberries. All right. Let's get along to the next. Oops. Sorry if I'm making everybody seasick changing videos here. <laughs> um, all right. Whoops, there we go. Sorry about the grass, guys. No, that's okay. Don't apologize about grass. Um, where's it gone? Sorry, because they're shot in a um, in the portraits mode. It just makes it a bit... Um, you want to squeeze into the screen. Yeah, trying to squeeze you all into the screen, um, but that's okay. Is this panel... You can't see the panel here, can you? Is that covering the video or is it... No, nothing's covering the video for no, you? No, okay. no. Okay, all right. Okay, the second part to the system is the valve. Um, you need to put a solenoid, electric operated solenoid on every valve to control it and run a wire all the way through your farm. There's two options to running wires. You can either run a single strand with decoders, which is similar technology to what they use in cars now, or we just opted for the old multi-strand where you've got a different color like this was, this was red and you've got a common black and every valve will have a different color. You can run six colors, nine colors, I think 13 colors. Um, that's simple, really. I mean, to run, it's a bit um, time consuming, I suppose, running the wires. It took us about three or four days running probably a few kilometers of wire. Um, it took me half a day to wire them all up. So that was, that was the easy bit. And I, I already had these type of valves where I just retrofitted them onto the auto function of my um, of the manifold here which you can get from any plumb, any irrigation store will give you a diagram of how to how to wire they, they have, how to plumb them up and wiring is pretty simple um, it's that easy we ran at the wire probably about foot underground um, it doesn't need conduit or anything it's, it's, it has its own own conduit and you just you just splice them into every valve once you've done that, I mean, there is sometimes issues where these things might fail or something. It's, um, it's pretty rare. This has been going here for three years and I've had one, one failure. Um, so, yeah, it's, they're, they're pretty good. And if you have a failure? Well, the block doesn't turn on. Do you get, no, does your phone notify you? No, it's not going to notify you. Um, you. There is some redundancies you can put on. Um, with flow meters, I'll, I can get into more of that probably when we talk in the Zoom meeting. Um, that gets a little bit complicated, but we just run around on every few days and just double check everything. And you know, you notice if something's not working. <clears throat> Pretty simple, really. Um, yep. Okay, the second part to the system. Oh, playing all over again there, Emmanuel. Yep. <laughs> um, so were there any questions regards that video of Emmanuel's? Um, Jeremy, I can see you've got your hand up there. Did you want to say something? Yes, please. Um, Emmanuel, any, how, how did you find your failure, um, the location of the failure? How did I find it? Yeah. Uh, just by, just by, um, by ear. So I, can hear, I, I could hear how hard the pump's running because obviously it's going to increase RPM and we're close enough that we can hear it. Um, when, when I don't hear and it's on a watering cycle and it's not increasing RPM, which would mean that the valve isn't turning on because it's not having to increase flow rate. So I could hear that there's something not right and I just do a run around and 
have a look at the controller on my phone, see which block is supposed to be operational at that time and, uh, and go and sort it out. It's not ideal. The ideal way would be to put probably a mag flow um, after the pump, which then would be able to, using, using the controller, would be able to learn how many litres per hour that block would use and it would notify me if, that was, if there was any, different, if there was any, any difference there. Um, apparently I can do that, but I just haven't got around to doing it yet. Very good, good. But how would you find the location if there's a failure in the wire? Um, so yeah. how would you find the location? Okay. Where's, where's the break? <laughs> so you know, what I, you know what I would do? What I would probably do is I would have someone in the shed switching and I'd go with a multimeter and just check when I'm getting a, when I'm getting voltage. And if I'm not getting like I know that, you know, red is block one, green is block two, blue is block three, and because they're spliced in, the red one's going to be the shortest. So I would test that one first. Someone in the shed turned it on. Okay, I've got voltage when you switch it, 24 volts. Go to the next one. Go to the next one. That's how I tested it when I set the whole system up. Okay, so let's say it's the red line. So valve one, how do, you, how do you find the break in that red line? Oh, you'd have to you'd have to pull it up. You have no choice. If you've if you lost okay. voltage between the controller and that valve, you would have to pull it up and find where it is. There's no other means of finding a break in a cable. Yeah. Gotcha. So um, I don't know why you'd get a break in a cable unless someone hits it and then there'd be evidence of someone hitting it. Well, we have, um, I mean, we're in a different part of the world, but um, white ants, um, rodents, whatever. Okay. Yes. I can't have, I can't say I've had any experience with, with uh, any of the sorts. So this is going into the third year now. And the only problem I've had is one solenoid has failed on me going into the, you know, the third year of usage. And of course, there's always going to be, you're always going to have a, a, a problem. If you have problems with, with pipes, they blow out. Um, you have problems with pump shutting down, whether it's electric or diesel, something's always going to give you a problem. Um, it's just whether you've got a, a checklist and I suppose on, on how to, how to you know, troubleshoot it, simple as that. Or if you, I suppose if you were in an area where there was the possibility of um, I suppose, uh, you know, rodents or, or any other sort of animals or anything that could um, cause harm to the wire, you just, you'd run it in a con, you'd have to run it in a separate conduit. Simple, spend the extra money. We didn't need to, but you could if you wanted. I suppose that would, that's probably what I would do if I was in an area that was, you know, prone to having those issues. Okay. All right. Should we scoot on to the next video then, Emmanuel? Yeah. All right. Um, I haven't seen any other questions in the chat box, but I'll keep my eye on it. So if you've got questions, pop them there. All right. I think this is the next one. This is the third. Um, this is the uh, engine watchdog slash variable speed drive. Um, so what it does is a wire coming down from the controller, which activates this to turn the engine on um, by this relay. And then there is a cable that comes off this that connects to the throttle of the diesel engine and either accelerates or decelerates in order to maintain engine speed and pressure. Um, really simple. So it was not really expensive to put in, surprisingly. Um, it didn't cost us that much. You can either run it like on auto mode, which means it's controlled by the controller. Um, when a program starts, it turns on or you can turn it over to manual mode and start it yourself and increase the revs or decrease the revs. Example. So if I was to start a program right now, I can just get on my phone, hit play, relays clicked, and motor will start in about 10 seconds. <coughs>
Nice, just there. That's it. All right. Thanks for that one, Emmanuel. Is there anything that you wanted to add to that video? Um, not really. That was the first time that engine started for four months. So <laughs> it just came out of retirement for the first time um, <laughs> since, since, since probably April, maybe five months. Okay. Um, we, obviously, we haven't had to irrigate, so I just started it for demonstration purposes. That's all. No, that's all right. Um, all right, so I think there's one video left, so let's bring that one up. It looks like it's about fertigation. Yeah. Okay, engine controllers over there. Around here, we have a 12 volt DC fertigation pump. It's, a, it's actually a, a piston pump like you would get in a 240 volt, but you can get them in 12 volt DC. Um, once again, that is controlled by the controller. So if we go back over to here, there's a relay that the controller clicks on, which will tell the pump to start or stop. And there's a tank outside, 1000 litre shuttle. That does, I can't remember how many litres um, I can't remember, it's, it's, it's about 250, it does about 250 or 300 litres an hour. So it's actually um, pretty decent for a 12 volt pump. It can, um, it, it works for our system anyway. You can, if you've got 240 volts and you've got, you know, electric pumps, well, it's easy to put a 240 volt, but if you've got just a diesel pump, um, and that, that will suffice. Or you can even get, you can even put two of them in a row. Um, if you need to, you get multiple head ones. Uh, uh, it's really simple. It's not like a Venturi where you can't control the rate. This has got a fully controllable uh, rate control. So you're going to get the same dosage all the time, um, not dependent on flow. So it, um, yeah, did, it's very Did you accurate. find you had to adjust that? Like there Was there an, a settling, oh, so we had settling to, in period? So, yeah, we just had to learn, um, obviously, how much we wanted to put out in each block and, you know, adjust it and trial it until we got it right. And since, since then we've got it pretty, pretty right that we're happy with it. Simple. All right, again, Emmanuel, anything you wanted to add on to that video? Um, so that's, it's a pretty simple system. You can get electronic controllers for those pumps or two volt, 40 volt pumps, which have got flow, flow uh, meters. Um, so it adjusts as per whether your flow rate increases, decreases. I'd like to, you know, play with this stuff moving forward, just haven't had time yet, so. Yeah. Okay. And I think if we were moving into, if so we're in, in, in soil grown at the moment, there's, you know, a lot of variables in soil growing, but if you were moving into hydroponics, well, obviously that would not be sufficient. You'd need to have flow meters and, and so you'd need to vary that rate dependent on the block sizes and so forth. So, but that's, it works quite well for us. Um, it's been, it's been a lifesaver actually, to tell you the truth. Um, the whole system, I save uh, that much time. So it's, no, it's really good. That's good to hear. Thanks, Emmanuel. Um, is there any other questions from people before we move on to Jeremy? I think you're next up for presenting. Um, if anyone thinks of anything, they can always pop it in the um, chat box again, as I said. Um, Andreas or Jeremy, did you have any questions for Emmanuel as well while we're on this? Look, I don't have any questions really, but but Emmanuel' experience with with uh, automation is is pretty pretty common when you talk to farmers that they see the value in time savings. It's not how much money, how much more they produce, how much less you know they spend. Is is that intangible value of time? Mm -hmm. uh, is being able to do, to have a life outside farming because they now have the tools that allow them to run the business and having a life as well. So being able to pick up the children from a school, as opposed to being checking the pump or checking the, you know, the things that that's, that's how automation needs to be viewed as well. It's, it's the time saving and, and you value time in different ways that I value my time. 
So when the question is how much how much value do you put to this, uh, is a question that you go uh, is different. You know the answer is quite different. Am I am I okay, Emmanuel? So um, I value I valued it as six thousand dollars a month with a return on investment in th in in four months, basically of what the system cost me. Do the maths. It cost me six thousand a month in my peak period when I'm watering heavily every day in in labour. There you go. So if I can't do it, because I don't have the time to do it, I would have to pay someone $6,000. That's it. So when you look at the numbers, um, that's a person running around all day, 10, 12 hours a day watering. Yeah. Now, um, a system like that's probably going to cost you just you know, 25000 30000 to install finished. It didn't cost me that much because I installed it myself. But if you paid someone for a turnkey, run the wires for me, hook them up, that's what it's going to cost you. That's only four months. Yeah. It's it's actually ridiculous to think that no one's doing it. Yeah. You know, if I, case, I, I, mean, would, I would put my money anywhere that I can get a four-month return on. That's it. I, I have worked with farmers that their farm was about 30 kilometers from where they live, and they had to go. It's a different thing. They were sort of switching, switching blocks, um, and then they would have to drive for about five hours a day when they didn't have the automation system on. And then when they actually sat down and did the numbers of the petrol plus the time, it paid off in a couple of years as well. So the other comment that I'd make to it as well is you cannot water as well as your controller can water because you're not gonna, you either, sometimes you leave it on not long enough or you leave it on too long and you get, you know, you get a lot of water leaching out um, because you physically, like for us, we found that about, about 18 minutes was optimal in, in terms of a pulse time to get, you know, to get, to get good water distribution. Now I don't, I can't go turn it on and go and, and turn it off in 18 minutes because in between those 18, I, I, there's nothing I can do in 18 minutes. Whereas for instance, my dad, he does most of the stuff around the farm and he can instigate an irrigation cycle and spray at the same time. You can't spray when you've got to change a block every 18 minutes. You'd, you'd be By the time you get in the tractor, you'd be back out of it going to change it. So your efficiency is much better as well. You, you can't do what the controller can do. You're not, humans aren't fast enough. Absolutely. So that's the other advantage. Okay. Thanks, Emmanuel. Yep. Um, uh, Tina, I think we've answered your, or Emmanuel's answered your question there, so we might um, move on to Jeremy, if that's okay with everyone. So Jeremy, I'll just get you to unmute yourself and share your screen, and Emmanuel and Andreas, I might just mute both of you, if that's okay, or ask you to mute. Yep. Okay, Chloe, can you confirm you've got that on the screen? I can see that on the screen, yes, perfect. Okay. Thanks, Chloe. Thanks, Angela and everyone for the opportunity. Um, I spoke to Angela a week ago and I'm new to strawberries, but just in the discussions in the last couple of days, I think um, some of the stuff, I hope some of the stuff I've got to say is, um, is relevant. I've only no, got two Sorry, two Jeremy. I've just seen an attendee pop their hand up. Sam, do you mind if we just wait until after Jeremy to answer your question? I hope that's okay. All right, sorry, Jeremy, fire away. Um, I've only got two main um, main points to make. Firstly, uh, drip drainage is more of a hardware issue with, with the way drippers are run. And, and uh, Emmanuel just mentioned pulse irrigation. And we'll talk a little bit about that as well. And then a couple of the modern methods of monitoring uh, a system performance that can be incorporated into what Emmanuel just talked about, which is a good, um, good follow on. So this is the, um, the conventional way we monitor a drip, si a drip system, um, uh, either pressures or discharges, and, and farmers can do this. You don't have to be an irrigation engineer or anything to do this. Um, uh, you can do pressures with a pressure gauge and a tapered attachment on the left here, and just put it over the top of the emitter. Uh, or you can measure the discharge out in the emitter. In this case, it's into a, a volumetric um, cylinder. 
And we might measure that for a minute or we tend to promote 36 seconds. Uh, and if it's sort of 15 millimetres, let's say, in, in that um, uh, container in 36 seconds, 15 millimetres is a, a, meter, a litre and 50, uh, 1.5 litres an hour, which is what the drippers are rated in litres per hour. If it was 20 mils, it's two litres an hour and away you go. This has got some challenges I can see with, um, with strawberries because we usually measure the extremities of the system. And if you've got drip line that is covered and protected and underneath, um, it's hard to do those things. So I think we've got some options about measuring those alternative options. You might be able to have a look at the things at the start and then the, the end of the rows, but anywhere in the middle um, uh, takes a bit of extra work. So that's the conventional way we measure it. And this has been highly pushed by departments and, and agencies uh, for a long time to try and get uniform application. You can't do much without a uniform application. What we have started to learn and, and recognise a lot more recently is system drainage or drain out, um, where you might go through and analyse and assess your drip system and, and measure the cups for 36 seconds and might find that they're all nice and even. But more and more, we're realising that things are happening after you turn off. And uh, in some situations in our area where an irrigator might pulse for an hour and turn off for an hour, the emitters down the end of the hill on the bottom of the slope continue to emit for the whole hour in between pulses. And therefore you lose your, your you lose the benefit of pulsing and they'll also continue to emit for up to 24 hours after the end of the irrigation um, event. And this is a problem, um, a big problem, especially in areas like mine where water is quite valuable and you have that unevenness. And so you, all of a sudden your system is not as even as what you thought it was. The situation here is, um, this is a typical irrigation valve with um, up, up on the right hand side and the fall away to the left, collected in a manifold in this case for flushing. Um, and yeah, a, a stylized diagram, but there's a lot of drainage down in the lowest point of the patch um, where the maximum drainage occurs. Um, this will be enhanced when you convert to pulsing irrigation. And this is why it's becoming such a problem in our areas. The nut crop, nut growers are pulsing quite regularly and it's always happened, but it's been acceptable under conventional drip irrigation methods. There's a bit of drainage at the end of the irrigation cycle, but if you're irrigating multiple times a day, it will drain multiple times a day in the same spot, usually heavier soil down the bottom and we end up with wet feet issues. Um, I had a call from a wine grape grower earlier in the week we spent a lot of money on soil moisture monitoring because he had this problem of, of wetness down the end of the, the patch and thought he would fix it by uh, purchasing scheduling equipment and, and put it in an average area and try and cut water back. But this was a hardware issue. This was a design issue. And um, like I said earlier, you can't do much without a nice even application to begin with. If you put soil moisture monitoring in the ground that it says it's dry up here and you put more on, then down the bottom just gets even wetter. And if you put the thing down the bottom, it says cut back and up the top gets too dry. It just doesn't work. So this drip drainage is gaining more recognition and we've been mucking around and doing cups uh, or, or buckets, um, leaving them behind under an emitter for 24 hours and measuring those volumes and we get the yellow areas here is a vineyard. Uh, this is a vineyard and the yellow areas are the low points in the landscape where eight to 10 times more water was discharging in those areas there. That means eight to 10 times more leaching, um, all sorts of issues come out of that. So as a result of that, we've put together a fact sheet um, in, in uh, combination with Metafin. Um, I can send that um, link to you or through Angela and Chloe, uh, but it talks about a lot of methods of fixing up that drip drainage. In the past, we would have said, just run your irrigation longer, fix up your dry patches. Today we say, fix the uniformity and that includes drip drainage for now. And, and the image here on the left is a non-return valve in a lateral there that stops all the water draining down to the bottom and splits up the drainage, if you like, um, further up the hill. In some cases, we can create a low drain system 
but more and more irrigators, if they're starting a new orchard, are asking their designers to produce a non-drain system to, uh, completely. Uh, we've had resistance from designers initially, but they're still starting to get their head around it and see it as a, more of an issue. So that's um, that's what I thought. Listening to Angela and uh, Emmanuel mentioned it before, pulsing, typical farming. If you start doing something that you think is an advantage and uh, it creates a, a problems elsewhere, and that's what pulsing has started to do in our part of the world, where it's quite popular. Um, and because of the recognition of this drip drainage, uh, there has been a swing back away from pulsing, in fact, and to more conventional irrigation management. Some of the more modern methods of monitoring your drip performance, um, the two methods that we've started to see adopted is uh, the use of satellite imagery, as well as inline sensors. Um, satellite imagery, the products available now are, are dozens and dozens, and they're coming out more and more all the time. I just want to present a couple here, just as examples. We're not favoring one over the other, but Irisat is one that is available to everyone, everyone in Australia, everyone across the, the world, in fact. It's uh, Google-based, it's free. Um, all you need to do is uh, download it, find your property on the Google map, draw a polygon around your property, and here's a slide of me doing so on, a, on a, an orchard. Now you complete the polygon, close it all up, you click on it, click on the completed polygon, polygon and all of a sudden you start to get some, some data from your property. And this is a, a strawberry farm. Uh, that I've been able to locate on Google Earth. Um, and it shows in the bottom graph, at least, these blue dots represent daily water use over the last season. And it shows a typical bell-shaped curve peaking in, in January and February and tailing off either side of that. The graph above it is, is a crop coefficient, which some of you may be familiar with, which is used to uh, help you with irrigation scheduling. Um, and we found this pretty useful, very useful. Um, the next slide, this is another one that I found a, a strawberry property. Uh, and speaking to Angela, um, in January, it's either being sprayed off or hoed out or whatever, or switched off anyway. And so it does recognize straight away, each of these dots is the water use for the week, um, the daily average for that week. And you can see that the, the water use disappeared straight away um, at the start of January when, when that management practice was put in place. The thing we're not so sure about is the effect. So this measures reflectance, um, uh, canopy reflectance, and, and determines how healthy the canopy is. And it, all it's got to be is a green canopy. So it doesn't work for red lettuce. Um, and some of the uh, people that provide this information, I'll put out an alert for canola growers at flowering, where everything's yellow. Uh, it says, ignore your readings for the time being until flowering is completed. Um, so it's all about just green leaf vegetation reflectance. And we're not so sure what in a strawberry situation the black mulches will do to that reflectance. So I haven't been able to determine that um, in the short time that we've been preparing this, but once the canopies are developed full enough to cover that black plastic, it shouldn't be a problem. If you've got covered protected cropping from over the top, it knocks out this situation, this option pretty well straight away. And this image here, we have table grapes in uh, Sunraysia, the part of the world I'm at. They're installed mid-January and you can see the, the readings disappear overnight as soon as those covers are installed. Um, those covers are installed for rainfall mitigation. So it's a problem that just we need to find out a little bit more about, but given the, the graphs that we're able to produce, the first two graphs that I showed you, I think there's some promise in being able to utilize this sort of thing for strawberry production. The other thing that uh, IRISAT will do is give you a seven day ETO forecast, uh, which is relatively new to irrigators. We've always worked in having the ETO readings for the last seven days uh, in various ETO apps and, um, and government sponsored um, services, but to forecast the next seven days is quite useful, especially for irrigating. Uh, and it has, this software has the ability to give you some scheduling 
five years if you enter irrigation events which are here in the pink it'll give you an irrigation trace and compare you against your uh, your annual ETO requirements so there's some promise there um, as a scheduling tool Generally, I mentioned earlier that this is the conventional way we monitor our performance of irrigation the beauty about irisat is that it can start to give us some spatial recognition of, of canopy health. Um, and this is Irisat here, and you can see the brown areas in the top left-hand corner. This is a situation where the drip system, we did an analysis and the drip, drips in the uh, top left-hand corner weren't performing, skinny little drip line, under design, not enough discharge. The, the vines looked all right. Vines are very tolerant, uh, but if we go back and look at something like this, this is able to, to determine that the poor irrigation system is having an effect on the crop. So in a situation where we've got drip line that's hidden and hard to get to and you can't measure it real well, um, this might be an option to be able to look it up um, and see if there's a, a uniformity issue in your orchard. Sorry, so Jeremy, uh, Andreas has just got a question there. Is that okay to pause for a second? Yeah, uh, Andreas, fire away. Yeah, yeah, no, no, Jeremy, thanks for for uh, for showing this. This is really interesting. I just have a question with those with the data for for evapotranspiration that you get from the irisat. Can you actually automate that data coming off the irisat to your controller? Uh, I'm sure there's a way, and and it's getting better every day. We've seen this data get incorporated into soil moisture monitoring, um, but I'm sure, and it might be a question we might be able to address later on in the presentation. I've got some. No, that's fine. That's um, fine. I just thought it was quite, quite, quite nice. And and if you could automate, you know, use that data and automate the your controller, then it, then you know, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. When I spoke to Angel about. This talk being a, a talk about automation, my my uh, immediate reaction to automation is linking. I think what you'll get leaning to is linking the scheduling to the, the system and, and turning the pump off and on and switching valves. And we've been cautious about that so far. We'd like to have the human element involved uh, and if something goes wrong. Um, but that's certainly something that's on its way, uh, yep. especially for Good. intensive irrigation events. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. So this is a free option, IRISAT. You can Google it and find it, and you'll be able to find your own property. Um, it, it, it's free. Uh, it's flown once a week. The pixel sizes are either 10 or 10 metres or 30 metres, uh, depending on which satellite gets picked up, depending on if there's a cloud in the way or not. But there are other dozens of options available now, proprietary products, that have pixel sizes that are 50, 30, 50, 60 centimeters. Um, and one of those is Sears uh, series. And so this, the precision of this is able to pick up what's happening in an individual row. And this particular company fly a couple of times a year, um, send you a map, send you these, locate these teardrops and say, hey, something's going on here. And, in, and the one in orange here, there's a red line which is saying that, that drip line has been pinched off or something wrong with it and the and the trees or the vines or the vegetables in that row have got something wrong there's a canopy issue um, uh, poor canopy health go out and have a look and uh, so it could be anything uh, it not only tells you if it's too dry there's an example down here uh, the other orange teardrop it's too wet so there's a leakage here and um, the canopies are larger than everywhere else so it does have an option for people who, particularly subsurface drip in a broad acre situation. Uh, and I think particularly if your drip line is under the black plastic and hard to get at and that sort of thing. Another example here, you know, a much larger farm and you can't keep up with it all. It'll highlight problems that are happening. So here, obviously there's a valve issue that didn't go on. Um, and that's an example, uh, Andreas, where automation failure and can happen if we get too tied up with technology. So um, it is able to pick up some issues there and obviously some boundary issues um, elsewhere as well. So 
it's quite popular, uh, the spatial tool. There are, we see Eurysat as a, um, a starting option for people to get used to it and then maybe go to these more proprietary products uh, that can give you a much finer precision. The other thing I want to mention is drip line monitoring and uh, a couple of products now next to the irrigation scheduling tool, put a transducer into the drip line close by uh, and, and continuously log um, with it, what the pressure is in that drip line. And it's again, another way to be, act as an alert to the irrigator to tell them that water exists. And, and this is the type of data we get. There's a fair bit here, but what we're interested in today is the blue tabs, which represent an irrigation event. And here on Wednesday the 22nd, there was two pulses. Wednesday the 23rd, there was two pulses. So it is confirming that water got to that particular patch um, and the grower can be reasonably content as long as it's being applied evenly and all the things I talked about earlier, as long as those are happening, that that particular patch is being receiving water. And this is a Phytech product. Um, another example here where you've got multiple valves and it will tell you what's happening um, and give you an alert whether there, no irrigation has gone on or in fact the irrigation has been stuck on and has been irrigated constantly for a number of days. And as we get larger properties, it's harder to keep control and keep alert to all of these things. Um, this sort of automation becomes more and more important. I saw the other day that they've got an app now for Thytech and this might be the CHAPS property and then we'll have individual patches to say yes, water got to these valves at the time that, um, that it was meant to. Another example, green brain, this is a typical irrigation trace here, um, uh, which is another topping in itself, but this particular software have the same transducer in a drip line that tells the irrigator that he's irrigating every day here and uh, each of these pink peaks will present an irrigation event. And it tells you that the drip line pressure was above 100 kPa, which is sort of our minimum. Uh, maybe bouncing around a little bit throughout the irrigation event, but it's above 100 kPa, which typically is required for drippers to perform properly. Bit of integration, mate, have an irrigation trace at the top here and the blue uh, vertical bars down the bottom are the, are the irrigation pressure events that I showed earlier on the same graph. Um, so you're able to see that an irrigation went on here and this is because uh, the pressure is received here. You can see here around June 2nd of May, uh, another one was stuck and we had a lot of water go through the profile uh, because the irrigation went for, went for hours and hours. And I think purple is a rainfall uh, and you can have a rain gauge that automatically measures that and puts that on the graph as well. We've had this sort of thing for many years, but now it's starting to be recognised that we don't want to have growers having to enter irrigation events, it's particularly how we're pulsing and we're irrigating much more frequently than we used to. Um, we haven't got the labour the time to be entering those irrigation events, if they can be automatically ended like this, whether it's through a pressure transducer or a rain gauge for rainfall, um, it ends up being a good result. The other thing I just want to finish off in, on is dashboard integration. So in the past, we've had some problems with companies who might monitor soil moisture. Another one might monitor pressure at the pump and the stuff that Emmanuel was talking about earlier. How can we integrate all that stuff? So in the last couple of years, companies have popped up that are about able to integrate those dashboards and they might be able to put it into one dashboard, but they can mirror it to the companies that might have talked to each other in the past uh, to put them onto one screen here. And I don't know about the color coordination here, but this is the soil moisture um, that's been put in here and maybe some temperature. There's a temperature gauge here on the left on the camera for whatever reason, uh, then in the, on the left-hand side and another one um, with, with pump pressures and faults and uh, flow rates and start-up times. And I've seen these ones where they're not only related to irrigation too, they can be related to spray diaries, um, locate where staff are, um, all sorts of things. And the people who are doing these now, uh, they're all about just integrating the, the, the uh, tools that are out there and putting them onto one platform so that you can see them in a quick and easy way. And that's been a good result. So to finish off, I've just got uh, 
something I keep banging on about throughout the presentation. Good irrigation management assumes uniform water application. Um, so important, especially as water becomes more and more valuable and we might be starting to skimp on irrigations. The uniformity or the poor uniformity starts to show up more and more. And we've got tools available now to be able to help identify that. Drip drainage is being recognised more so um, nowadays for a similar reason that I just described. And there's major technology advances that are around. We want to make sure that they uh, are suitable for the production system that you're interested in. <laughs> the concern about re reflectance of um, black plastic, that kind of thing, is something we really want to pin down before we start to invest in some of these things, if that's applicable. And I think that's about it for me, um, Holly. You're on mute. I hope it was good. You're still on mute. Chloe, you're muted. Here I am chatting away. Um, <laughs> um, so, uh, Jeremy, I was just going to say, I'm going to ask uh, what might seem like a silly question because I'm not a grower or a farmer in any respect. Um, but what do the satellites actually measure? What are they monitoring? Yeah, there's an equation and it could be a whole other topic on its own, but it's NDVI. There's a, a range of uh, ratios that they'll measure, but basically at the end of the day, what a grower wants to know is canopy health. And it's the temperature of the canopy. And if it's not transpiring adequately, it starts to warm up. And it can also be the size of the canopy as well. And it's just the variation within the orchard that starts to pick those things up. We have reflectance off our mid rows as well from the soil, and we've got other products that are able to um, separate the soil reflectance from the canopy reflectance and really pick up that variation within an orchard. Um, now we're starting to, well, not now, we've, we've started to work on tools that convert that reflectance into KC values, crop coefficient values, which that can then be linked up to a weather station. And I forgot to mention that with, with IRISAT is that it'll link up to the closest weather station uh, that's been recognised and start to give you a daily water um, demand estimation. Fascinating. Um, Emmanuel, I can see you've got a questioner there. Can Sam have a question before me? He I might have he's... done. Um, Sam, do you want to stick your hand up again if you um, still have that question? You go away, uh, Emmanuel, fire away. Okay, um, Jeremy, just going back to water uniformity, because I have noticed massive issues um, with water uniformity, pre-controller and post-controller. And some of the other issues that I found with it, not only drainage in the lowest point, but um, water blockage in emitters, air ingestion, which is causing, um, you know, to, to suck soil back in. Um, that issue as well. And um, the third issue that I find, which is, seems to be rife within the irrigation industry, is underspecking filtration as per the manufacturer's specifications. Yeah, yeah agree, all those problems. Uh, all industries have been through those issues. Uh, the suck back issue, as you turn off, especially on sloping ground, water's yeah. got to come, air has got to come back into the drip line. Um, and it can take soil with it. So we need some air valves, air release valves. Um, in those, it's virtually a, a subsurface system, really. So air valves are quite important and they may have been missed. Um, you had about three things there. The, yeah. the, the drip drainage, the, the fact sheet uh, has, we've, you know, we've had a lot of uh, changes to management. We, we used to run our submains downhill. Now we started to run them uphill because it's easy to handle this drip drainage. There's drip lines now that can retain water within them uh, to about a metre and a half, uh, two mm -hmm. and a half metres of, of pressure. So if your fall is under that two and a half metre fall from the top to the bottom, that might be an option and water is retained within the drip line. And that's certainly an advantage. If you've got 18 minute pulses and it takes five minutes to fill your system, it's only a 12 minute pulse somewhere. You yeah, see, um, the other thing we noticed too, Jeremy, was um, when I looked at, um, the specifications for the drip lines we're using being that they're a lower quality than what say a tree crop would use because they're more of a permanent fixture. Um, I probably couldn't 
find a farm that was working within the specifications of the product because we're all on pretty severe slopes in the Arrow Valley and the gradient for the row, the, you know, your, your row length is, you know, some of the, to be within specification on, on, the, on the products that we've all been using and recommended have been down to row lengths of around 20 metres to, be, to fall within, fall within um, you know, 80 to 90% um, efficiency. No one has got 20 metre rows. Yeah, no, you can't. It really needs a rethink about design. And we're talking about running systems uphill instead of down. Uh, that might mean your pump duty is higher and, uh, you know, there might be some extra energy prices, energy costs, but um, uniformity is, is so important and you can't avoid I know, it. I've found that with, with the product that we're using, a, a flat cost-effective cut that comes with emitters every 150 mil or whatever, there is really nothing on the market that's going to give us the efficiency that we need unless you go to a solid, a solid dripper, which yeah. then is, yeah. is really more of a fixture than removable. Yeah, well, you can remove those still and you might have to start thinking like, like a permanent planting. I've tried non-return valves at the top, halfway, looping the system, flush valves that, that flush at less than, I think, four or five metres. So that way there you've got full drainage out the bottom and you, you flood the end of the, bed, uh, end of the block rather than the bed itself. I've tried all these things um, and it's so hard. It's really it's problematic on the slopes that we're in. Plus, there's, no, there's no single answer. Some of your yeah. comments remind me of the blueberry growers who met in a previous life uh, on steep slopes and the designs weren't suitable for, and there wasn't a drip product available to handle the slopes that were being irrigated at. And yeah, and then you throw in the issue that we have not very good quality water. So we've got dirty water pretty well. There's a lot of sediment. Yeah, yeah. No, you've got plenty to think about and uh, irrigation, you know, it, it's not a thing that you should be designing yourself. It's a serious issue and uh, filtration, the things that we take for granted because, you know, the, the designers are certified and this sort of stuff and being well trained. Um, it still falls back on those simple design principles that you can't skimp on. Unfortunately, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, we've got products that talk about being, you know, a coefficient of uniformity of 100%. There's no such thing as a uniformity of 100%. 92, 95 is about the best. Um, and on slopes that you were talking about, yeah, it's a challenge. You might have to have a rethink about the design if you're going to redevelop a patch and, and talk about running uphill. Have a look at that fact sheet that we can get to you and, um, you know, you can run things uphill now, this sort of thing to handle the drip drainage. Yeah, very good, thanks. Um, all right, well, if there's no many more, no more questions for Jeremy, I can't spot any in the chat box. We might move on to Andreas. Sure, let me, okay. just share my, let me share my screen here. No worries. And I'll... How's yeah, that? That looks perfect to me. Fire away, Andres. Excellent. Look, um, thanks, Emmanuel, and thanks, Jeremy, for, for such a nice introduction to what I'm going to have to say, really. Because what I have to say is, in a way, is the theoretical aspect of all these irrigation efficiency things that we do. There's a lot of things that we do for irrigation efficiency. And irrigation efficiency is one of those words that is used by everybody in whatever context, uh, you know, sue them to say it. Uh, and it's a, there's, there's a little bit of everything that is actually quite important and is needed, but I guess that the idea of irrigation efficiency has to be understood holistically so that we can really achieve higher irrigation efficiencies. Uh, I had nothing prepared for today, but then when I realized that someone had pull out from, from today's uh, presentation, I sort of recycle a presentation that I do on irrigation efficiency in the courses that we do here at Irrigation Australia. And I thought, let's actually talk more about irrigation efficiency in general, so that you know, the audience actually understand how it's used and where it should be used in, in a more uh, appropriate way. So that's what I have prepared for you in the next uh, 25 minutes. 
I was told it was 20, and then I was told that someone had actually, not, you know, unavailable to come. So I made it 30 minutes. Hopefully we can actually go through this quite, quite quickly, because it's basically concepts that I'm going to be talking about uh, today. So Irrigation Australia training is, Irrigation Australia is the association of irrigation in, in Australia, as we know, and we've been for over 30 years delivering training and developing courses, uh, you know, custom-made courses, and also have an information delivery arm that we do here at Irrigation Australia. Uh, at the moment, we have a, an number of short courses that include certified meter validation and installation, very much uh, in demand in New South Wales, in, in Queensland, and soon in Victoria when the regulation actually kicks in in, in Victoria, for which you will have to be a certified meter validator and, and, and installer. We have courses on irrigation efficiency, as we have courses in sandy pivot in lateral move. Uh, then we also have other courses in terms of introduction to irrigation, and we have pumps and systems, um, just to name a few. Uh, the certification programs that we have is a number of those as well, certified irrigation designer, certified irrigation retailer, certified irrigation manager, meter installer, irrigation installer, irrigation agronomist, irrigation operators, and irrigation contractors. All those certification programs that we manage and administer here at Irrigation Australia that are there to upskill people that are working in the irrigation space. Okay, so that's sort of the, a little bit of an infomercial from Irrigation Australia. And now getting into irrigation in the strawberry. Um, we know how sensitive the plants are, strawberry plants are, to, to irrigation, irrigation regimes, irrigation scheduling, and, and water quality, very, very important for you guys. And you guys know this better than we do, uh, how important the quality of water is, is for, for irrigating the strawberries. Um, when it comes to these sort of crops, uh, automation and, and precision irrigation is often used because of the number of, um, of irrigation that is actually uh, required. And, and it's been seen how using a drip irrigation is, is one of the, the most common irrigation systems for, for the strawberries, not being the only one, for sure. Um, but when it comes to irrigation efficiency, I guess that is, it is important to step back and then really ask, ask the question, what's irrigation efficiency really? And, and also realize that there are different types of irrigation efficiencies. And I guess that that's when vendors and people in certain areas assume that what they do is what is needed for irrigation efficiency, when it's really the combination of everything people talk about irrigation efficiency that needs to be in place to really, really achieve a higher irrigation efficiency and water conservation as well. So understanding the, the plant water requirements is, is one of the most fundamental parts of irrigation efficiency. And, and soils, uh, we, we need to realize that when we actually talk irrigation, we don't irrigate the plants. We basically irrigate the soils so that the plants can take the water from the soils for the needs. So irrigation is something that we actually practice just for the soil. And the soil acts as, as a bucket where, where the water is stored. And then we really need to know that bucket. Is that a seven liters bucket or a nine liters bucket? Or we actually have a 15 liters bucket. Does it have holes in it? Uh, is there any big hole in it that we actually need to be considering? Because that's where we're storing the water. And anything that has to do with that bucket soil uh, would actually be conducive to having higher or lower irrigation efficiencies. So not only do we talk about irrigation efficiency as the system being efficient, the pump being efficient, the controller being efficient, the, the variable speed drive being efficient, the, the, the pipes being efficient, the emitters being efficient. It's everything in combination that we really need to understand how it all plays a role in getting irrigation efficiencies, all right? So what's involved in irrigation efficiency endeavors? And I guess that we need to start at some point. We need to start measuring irrigation system performance. We need to know what the system that I have in place 
the one that I have to work with is performing. Is it performing well? Is it performing adequate? Is it actually underperforming? Or is it actually overperforming? All these questions we need to, we need to know. Because you can actually go in and, and do automation and, and invest a lot of money in systems that are underperforming. And the real benefit of all those expenses, all those investments into irrigation efficiency is only going to go so much uh, up to the point of how efficient is your system really? Right? I mean, a better pump, a better emitter is only going to do their thing provided that everything else is in harmony with that system. So getting to know the system performance or understanding how well my system is performing is really, really important. Okay, so we now talk, that's hardware, but we also need to talk about the fundamentals. How much do I know my plants? Do I know the, the root zone of my plants? That's a question that you ask farmers or growers of any crop. And you say, what's the root zone What's the root zone of your crop? And, and you ask 10 people and you get 15 different answers. It's, it's, not quite, it's not quite understood how deep the root zone of different crops are. For some people it's five centimeters, or they're all 200 mil or half a meter. And they are growing the same thing. And it's not, a, it's not a, an agreement on how long is the root system in my crop. And that is very important because depending on how long your root system is, is the soil that is available to you to use. That determines the height of that bucket that we're talking about here. So if we don't actually understand the plants, and, and it also understand that the plants, uh, depending on the plant, there are times where stress in the plant is, is welcome. Or there are times in, in the growing that having a stress is so detrimental that might actually affect your yield by 20, 30, 40%. And that's all about the plant. So not only do we need to understand how efficient my system is, my hardware is, but also I need to understand my soil and my plant. And most importantly, we need to understand the correlation in between those three. That soil, plant, water relationship need to be understood so that we can really talk about increasing irrigation efficiencies, right? Now, yes, we talk about irrigation uniformity and we have spoken about that today. It is a very important part of irrigation efficiency. We, need, we haven't yet spoken about precipitation and application rates, but that is so important to determine. And you only determine that, not based on the catalog that you actually have when you buy a sprinkler or when you buy a dripper. You actually have to measure that in place in your system and see how much is being applied over a period of time. How much water, how many millimeters of water are being applied in the 15 minutes that I have set my controller to apply? Am I applying what is needed? Am I applying too much or am I applying too little? Right? So all these things are part of that irrigation efficiency work. That in understanding the soil, in understanding the plant, in understanding the system, it's, it's, it's really important. But if we don't have a, a program for operation and management and troubleshooting of the irrigation system, that irrigation efficiency that we're aiming at would be sort of slippery. Because once something happens or fails, and the troubleshooting is not there, or the maintenance is not there, the whole irrigation efficiency that we are aiming at is going to go down, right? So we really need to understand that in order for us to really talk about irrigation efficiency, more than one thing has to happen. And that is sort of the core of, of, my, of my presentation today. So to start with, with the irrigation efficiency definition, then we need to define irrigation. And it's a good point to start defining irrigation. That is the artificial application of water to the soil for the purpose of supplying moisture that is essential to plant growth. That is irrigation. You apply water to the soil for the plants to take. No more, no less, but just what is just for that, right? And that is irrigation. Now, when it comes to the efficiency, then we also 
refer to the definition of efficiency for any sort of process. Efficiencies can be defined as a peak level of performance that uses the least amount of inputs to achieve the highest amount of output. And that applies to us in the irrigation space. It's using the water, only the amount of water that is required, no more, no less, to achieve higher yields. When we, we combine those two, when we combine the irrigation definition and the efficiency definition, things become a little bit more clear, right? So irrigation efficiency is the ratio of the amount of water that is consumed by the plants or crop or grass to the amount of water that is supplied through irrigation. In order for us to be able to do this, we need to know both. We need to know how much water is being used by the plants and we need to know how much water is being applied by the system, right? That system that we have to work with. So in, in in mathematical terms is, is basically this. We have the water that is used by the plants and we have the water that is applied. That ratio in between those two is what we can call irrigation efficiency. But actually the more water that we apply, the less efficient the system is because extra amount of water uses resources, uses money, uses labor, uses energy that is not really required because once the water is, that is used by the plants is available, you don't have to irrigate anymore. But oftentimes we don't know that. Oftentimes we don't know how much water is actually stored in my soil because I don't know my soil. And I can actually treat soils all the same. I can treat my sandy soils, same way that I treat my clayey soils, in the same way that I treat my silty soil because my system applies water same. Knowing that those soils would actually take the water or retain water in different ways are gains for us to only apply what the water, what the soil can actually hold, right? So that's, that's how understanding the soil, understanding the plants and understanding how my system actually performs is really important when it comes to irrigation efficiency. So the way that I have irrigation efficiency defined is that is made up of three components, each one of those equally important. So it is as important for the irrigation efficiency to know the fundamentals, and that is to know my soil, to know my plants, to know my water. But also I have to understand how my system is performing. But not only that, but I also have to combine those two with good practices of management and operation. If you have any of those three elements failing, that's gonna cause that the irrigation efficiency will also be failing, that is lower efficiencies. And the only way to bring those irrigation efficiency higher is by actually increasing the, our understanding of the fundamentals, increasing our understanding of the system performance and increasing the, the management and operation practices that we have in our irrigation systems, right? So yes, you can have the best management and operation system, but if you have a system that underperforms, you're not gonna go very far. Or if you don't understand that you have limiting soils and you have the best performance system, and the best management and operation, but you don't understand really your soil, then you're not gonna be able to achieve irrigation efficiency as you would if you didn't know more about your soil, if you didn't know more about your plants. So I guess that this is the, the main concept in here is for us to really achieve irrigation efficiencies. There's more than one thing that we need to do. It's, it's more than the, the best pump. It's more than the best variable speed drive. It's more than the best filtering system more than the best soil moisture sensor. It's more than the best evapotranspiration meter, for the lack of a better word. It's everything combined that is needed, right? So when it comes to that irrigation efficiency, it can be broken down into two groups of efficiencies. One is the application efficiency that has everything to do with the hardware. 
in this one that is the timing of irrigation events, and that is management. How do I operate my system? Am I actually scheduling properly? Which method of irrigation scheduling am I using? Is that working? All right. So the combination of those two actually also make things clearer in terms of measuring the irrigation efficiency. All right. Um, the, the water management efficiency term quantifies how well the irrigation water is being managed. So how well the irrigator minimizes the additional water that is needed after accounting for non-uniformity. Those non-uniformities are things that we sadly have to live with. Because in the case that Jeremy was talking about, in the case that Emmanuel was talking about, inefficiencies are issues and they have to live with those. There's only so much we can do. And there's a point of, you know what? I'm going to have to live with this and that's fine. The point is trying to minimize those, not to actually eliminate, because you might be spending a lot of time and effort into something that might not be achievable, be it the topography, be it the water quality, being a number of things, being the, the soils, uh, but aiming at getting better is what we need to really be achieving higher irrigation efficiency. You know, things like, when do I apply? When do I irrigate? Do I, am I irrigating when there's when high winds because it's when I have the people available to do my irrigation? That might be a yes, that's when I actually irrigate, but there's nothing else I can do. Well, therefore we have to deal with those efficiencies. We wanna reduce those inefficiencies of losses because of drifting, of losses because of high winds, then this other thing that we could do. Now, the question is, are you willing to pay the price to achieve those high efficiencies? And the answer to that is an individual one, right? Am I actually monitoring how much water is actually being infiltrated in my soil? Or am I just doing what my dad did? Or is just my doing what the neighbors have done in the last 15 years? Do I actually know if I am over irrigating? Do I have a way to sense or monitor that the water is actually passing below the root zone? Do I know that? Or am I irrigating a time when really there's no need to irrigate because there's, I know my soil and there's enough moisture in the lower part of my, of my root zone and my plants are showing no signs of being stressed. But I just went in and dug and in the first three centimeters, I felt that it was dry. So I went ahead and irrigated again when I probably didn't need to, but the water was there. You just couldn't see it. You just didn't know that it was there because lack of money. There's a number of things that we do on, a, on an everyday basis that can be improved. Monitoring is one of those, right? So we end up having systems that can be very efficient, like those graphs in there where the timing of irrigating was good. There was just enough to have a depth of water down to the lower part of your root zone. We can also have a very inefficient system where we actually irrigate it for longer time and we have depths of water passing well the, the lower part of my root zone. But if I don't have anything that is telling me this is happening, I can continue to do this season after season. And when you actually see that extra amount of water there, and you put numbers to it, you go, if I have an allocation of water, am I actually overusing my allocation of water by doing this? Yes. How much money have I spent on my pump, pumping that water that is of no use? Money. How many more hours of labor did I have or did I pay for to achieve that sort of irrigation because I didn't even know I was doing it? Things that we can improve to be more efficient, right? So the, the idea is to get to a uniform and efficiency combination. Watering just the root zone, actually watering 70% of my root zone, which is called the uh, effective root zone. That would get you through, no issues, okay? 
So all these things are the sort of stuff that we, the more we know, the better we can actually do, the better that we can actually perform in our irrigation system and, and therefore achieving higher efficiencies, right? Um, this is graphs of things of, of irrigation being uniform or non-uniform and being efficient or non-efficient and, and seeing what happens when the moisture in the soil is not uniform or is passing the root zone or not covering the root zone or in cases like this, we have a very homogeneous coverage of the root zone, but we have over the irrigation in certain spots. We, that might be the indication that I have a series of sprinklers or a series of uh, reapers that are actually discharging more, and I don't know, right? So there's a number of those things. For a uniform and efficient irrigation system, and actually, it actually goes down to an irrigation event because efficiency should actually be measured per irrigation event. In every event, the goal is the same. You supply water to the soil for the plants to take over a period of time. So I might have the same irrigation system. Indeed, I do have the only irrigation system that I have, but I can operate that system, not 100, 95% efficient today. But I can also utilize the same irrigation system a week after and operated at 30% efficiency. If, if that day, for whatever reason, I let the pump run for the next half an hour. The efficiency there just drops because you didn't up applying a lot more water that it was required. Therefore, that particular irrigation event was very inefficient, yet you have the same system, right? So I hope you guys see my point in there. So the irrigation efficiency is, is larger than we actually think of it. And it's a word that is abused by people in our industry. The intentions are good, but it's not the whole truth. Because the whole truth is, is hard for anyone to have it. But having an open mind, having an understanding that is more than the pump, that is more than the sprinkler, that is more than the soil sensor, that is more than the water meter, that is more than the variable speed drive helps. Because you remove those barriers that let you actually see what you're actually dealing with. You're dealing with plants. You're dealing with soil that are quite variable. You're dealing with water that has issues with it. You're dealing with energy. You're dealing with old pumps. You're dealing with a number of situations. You're dealing with labor. How do we actually tweak every single one of those to make, to aim at getting higher efficiency? That's the challenge, okay? So again, for the irrigation to be highly efficient, both the irrigation, the application efficiency and the irrigation of management need to be high, okay? That is better said in here. Now, in things, in, it, things that ha when you are irrigating efficiently, you can actually have realizations like this. This is a, a graph that I took from a research being done in, in Canada of, of two irrigation um, management practices, right? So one was using the old fashioned way and the other one was using micro sprinklers. Over a season, these were the results. One system, the old fashioned way, used 120,000 gallons per acre. The other, the one using the micro sprinkler system, used 81,000 gallons per hour, per annum, that is. The way that they look was exactly the same. One was being over irrigated. The other one was being just irrigated to what it needed to be. But the difference in those two is that you ended up saving over 215 cubic meters per hectare safe by having things simple as having an, an audit on your irrigation system, knowing the application rate of the system, 
tweaking when it was when it was different, tweaking when it was low or higher, by just doing a tune-up system, having a soil moisture sensor telling you when to start irrigating and when to stop irrigating based on moisture in the soil. So these are the sort of gains that you can actually achieve when you use things, irrigation efficiency properly. All right. So another important thing that was sort of discussed by, by Jeremy, the hardest thing is to try to bring an irrigation system to a high, to be highly efficient when there's flaws in the design. With this flaws in the design is really, really challenging and, and costly to try to bring those systems to a decent level of irrigation efficiency or performance efficiency, should I say, right? So a well-designed irrigation system can determine the efficiency and effectiveness of water use and therefore influences the profitability of the business. You're dealing with a, an irrigation system that has serious issues with the design. Not only will it be really hard to get there, but anything you do would actually cost a lot of money. So revising what we have, or making sure that if I'm starting a, a new pattern, the irrigation system is done properly, right? And you see the guy that sell the pump, doing the irrigation design. You see the guy that do the soils doing the irrigation design. And there's a combination of trades or professions into designing an irrigation system that we need to actually tap into because we can't know everything. So there's people that know the soil, there's people that know the pumps, there's people that know the, the uh, energy savings is the combination of all that knowledge that is required to really bring in a irrigation system to be more efficient, okay? We also deal with different methods. So applying water to the soil, yeah, we understand that, but you can apply water to the soil in a number of ways, right? You can use micro-irrigation, you can use drip, you can use center pivots, linear moves, you can use sprinklers, micro spring. you can use a number of things. Now, the, the decision to what to choose to get my irrigation system more efficient is a very individual one. It's a paddock, it's a paddock dependent sort of situation. And there's only no one thing. And, it's, and the system can, all, can only do one thing. But I can have a drip irrigation system that is said to be the most efficient system. And I can have a normal sprinkler system. If I have my sprinkler system well operated, well maintained under a irrigation schedule frame, and I have a drip irrigation system that I don't know what I'm doing, but it's, an, it's a drip irrigation system, I can actually end up over irrigating more with my drip irrigation system managed that way than I would with my own sprinkler system, all right? So we need to really understand that the system in itself, yes, it has a theoretical efficiency, but in reality, it's how well I operate it, right? Provided that there's no you know, huge flaws in, in, in the design, you can use any of those different methods into achieving more efficient system, right? Now, if you're dealing with that, if you're dealing with water quality issues. It doesn't really matter what system you use. You have an issue with your water. And not only that issue with your water can actually damage your irrigation system, but it can damage your soil. We're dealing with pH in, in the water. What do we do? Does it matter if I use drip or if I use a center pivot or if I use a micro spray? Does it really matter? No. Your water quality is the issue that we need to attack. And that has ties to irrigation efficiency as well, right? So when it comes to that, for instance, the water sources, we need to be able to identify, evaluate, measure, review water use and allocation 
to be able to really understand my water, remember fundamentals, understanding my plants, understanding my soils and understanding my water. Right? And this is what I'm talking about. So we know how demanding strawberries are for water quality, uh, how sensitive they are to salts. If I have that situation, that's the water that I have, what can I do to work with that water? How much am I willing to spend in treating that water? Does it actually make economic sense? Right? Or am I gonna to have to settle for a you know, type C strawberry? It might be the case, but irrigations, when you talk about stalling an irrigation system, the expectation is that everything is gonna be fine. Everything is gonna be rushing. Now I have spent a million dollars on my irrigation system. The expectation is that from this point on, life is gonna be easy. It is not so. We need to understand more to be able to maximize on those investments, All right? Um, if I have issues with soil pH, how does that have anything to do with my irrigation system? Does it is the question. Can I actually uh, apply amendments through my irrigation system to combat the pH situation? Those sort of questions we need to ask ourselves. Um, again, in order to achieve high irrigation efficiency, simple questions need to be answered. How much water, when, and how best to apply? And only when we actually answer those questions, when we know the answer to those, then we can embark on that journey of irrigation efficiency, right? And then buy the right things, consider the right things, um, invest in, the, in, in what is gonna determine higher yields. Know what is on sale, know what is on fashion, know what the neighbor has done to his father. He's actually looking quite good. His situation might be totally different to yours, right? So things that we need to know in terms of um, irrigation efficiency are then sort of in a summary, underlying soils, plant water requirements, proper design, proper installation, irrigation monitoring, and performance test, okay? So there's a number of principles that sort of govern irrigation efficiency. I'm just gonna apply it through these ones, but are quite, quite important. So the principles for irrigation efficiency are that the amount of water applied is appropriate to the plant's needs and soil properties. The water is applied effectively and uniformly that the water is applied to the plant root zone without wastage, and that is runoff, deep drainage, wind drift, and excessive evaporation. And lastly, that the timing of water application suits the plant and reflects the weather conditions. Those are the principles of irrigation efficiency. And when you look in those, into those irrigation efficiency principles, a little bit of everything is thrown into that. Soils, water quality, and equipment, all right? So when it comes to soils, for instance, knowing basic things like what's the effective root depth of my, soil, of my crop? What's the field capacity of my soil? Do I know what field capacity is? What's the permanent wilting point of my soil? In other words, how well do I know my soil retention properties? Do I know them? How am I using those? Am I using those? What do I know about the texture of my soil? Is there any issue with the structure in my soil? Questions that need to be answered for irrigation species. All right? So there's a number of things that we can, I mean, I can continue talking this for, for hours, but time is limited and I don't want to bore you, know, bore you guys out with, with, with my theory, 
but it's, it is no theory. There are factual things that we really need to know in order to justify the investments that we make in trying to achieve higher, higher efficiency. Soil water monitoring, a very important one. This is actually us keeping an eye on the bucket. That's what it is. Keeping an eye on the bucket. Am I dealing with sandy soil? Does it mean that I, if it does, then it means that I can actually work with this. I just need to come more frequently and apply small amounts of water because that soil is not going to retain it. Or am I dealing with clayey soil so that, that I can apply water and relax because the water is going to be there for a while because I actually know how what my my available water. I know my soil, I know my root zone, I know my available water. Now what I need to focus on is how much are my plants taken? Then I go to the herbicide, then I go to the bomb, then I go to my ET meter, to whatever way you use to determine how much water to monitor how much water your crop is using is what then you combine. When, when Jeremy spoke about the, the dashboard integration system, that's fantastic. You can actually have what's happening in your soil. You can actually have what is happening with the weather, therefore the vapor transpiration. And you can have a, another one in here showing you your pump and your tank or your reservoir level. Beautiful. All those things are really things that aid irrigation. Right? Um, soil determines where to best crop anything. When the, when the growth is at its maximum, it is all defined by the field capacity of the, of the soil. So when, when there's enough water in the soil and, and there's nothing actually dripping out of it, and when is the time for me to refill so that I can guarantee that my crop is not gonna go under stress because of water. I can't tell that my crop is not gonna go into stress because of a plaque or because of a, of a disease. That's a whole different thing. The thing that I can manage through irrigation have to do with making moisture available to my soil. And how do I do this? Knowing my soil knowing what is called the ready available water. So for us to really manage efficiently an irrigation system, an irrigation event, is getting to know my soil, all right? And of course, the operation and maintenance is required. How often do we do checks? How often do I do, yes, do I check my pressure in my pipes? Do I check the pressure in my emitters? Are they applying uniformly? When was the last time that I did a catch can test on this system? Am I asking, did I do the catch can test and then went and fixed things that were not working okay? Or through my maintenance program, my monthly program or my seasonal program, I went and made sure that all the components of my system was operating okay as per design, run a catch can test, and could then tell how much water was being applied in, in block one, in block two, and in block three. Because actually when I turn the pump on, the same amount of time that I have my, my pump for block one is what I have for block B and block C. Is that water being used the same? Is that bucket being filled the same? Questions, right? Um, and, and with, with the irrigation efficiency that we're now talking about here, then called the fair irrigation. A fair irrigation is uses the irrigation system. So the more efficient the irrigation system is, the more efficient your fair irrigation can be too, right? Um, again, drip irrigation is great for, for, for fair irrigation um, application but you really have to manage your, your drip irrigation properly. You can easily over-irrigate. And ir over-irrigating is not just about the time, it's about the soil that you're dealing with, right? So those concepts of, of um, irrigation and using drip, they are all applied, but still we need to know 
solar. Okay, so I, I don't really want to talk about fertigation. Fertigation itself is, is, a, is, a whole, is a huge topic, but I guess that the message about fertigation that I want to convey today is fertigation is going to be as good as your system is. Your fertigation is going to be as effective and as efficient as your irrigation system is. Because through it is how you use it. Right? So I guess that the last thing I want to say is what I have already said, and is this. The take home message is irrigation efficiency is made up of three components. The understanding of the fundamentals, that is soil, plants, and water, the system performance, am I using my system to its maximum capacity? Was my system well designed? Am I using the right components? Am I using the right pump? Am I using the right filter? Am I using the right emitter? Do I have different emitters all over the place? The one that I bought at Bunnings, the one that I bought at uh, Toro, the one that I bought at Rainbird, the one that I bought from Metaphor. Is that my situation? or through my operation and, and maintenance program, I make sure that I have in stock the same kind of emitter that my system was designed for, so that when it fails, I can actually come and replace it and have my system still performing under the design. That sort of thing. So take home message. Irrigation efficiency is not what the guy that sells pumps tells you, the guy that sells micro sprinklers tells you, no, the guy that sells soil monitor things is tells you, it's everything combined. It's everything combined. And no one holds the whole truth. But pieces from here, from there, from there, and everywhere is what we need, not just one thing. That's, that's all I have uh, for you guys, and I'm open to questions. Thank you very much, Andres. That was very fascinating. And you are definitely a mine of information. I feel like you can teach people a lot. <laughs> oh, um, uh, just checking, I've just prompted people to see if there's any questions from yourself or from any of the other panelists. I might just get you to stop sharing your screen and that absolutely, way we can- Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks, well, that way we can just see all the panelists. Um, did any of the other panelists have a question for Andreas, or has anyone in the um, audience got a question for Andreas? You're going to have crickets. No, you're too use you're too knowledgeable, yeah. Andreas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hang on, Emmanuel's got his hand up. Here we go. Hang on. Um, ask away, Emmanuel. Hang on, I'll just unmute you. Just unmute yourself, Emmanuel, and then you can ask your question. Yeah, I, I probably haven't got a question, but I'll mm -hmm. just probably. Um, like to reinforce what Andreas has said, um, get a professional to design your system. I, I have been to so many farms and backyards that probably resemble each other. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, you just need a fair bit of skill to be able to do it. And it's going to make the difference whether your system is going to work or it's not. So um, yeah, that's probably the key thing that I would say. Uh, and even just um, looking at what, like when I, I started in the industry about 10 years ago and looking at what other people were doing, um, I soon found out that um, looking wasn't going to help me because every farm is different. Every hill is different. And that means that every system needs to be designed to suit that particular property. Mm. Um, and its conditions. So yeah, just get get someone that knows what they're doing to do it for you. Simple as that. I just think that's probably the most important point. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more with you. Yeah, it's um, it's it's crucial. I mean, even just the savings, just by running a main correctly, um, I can irrigate the same amount of of land for probably less than 10% of the energy costs that you would if you did not get an engineer to design your pipe, your, your, your main line. I mean, that's how, how crucial it is. And you think about the savings there, that's not just an efficiency in terms of your crop, it's money in your pocket because the extra money that you're going to spend 
doing it right is going to save you tenfold in the future. It's, it's that important. And not only for efficiency, for um, longevity, because it won't break down. Simple. And, and, and Emmanuel, and it is quite, it's quite sad when you see the, the people that work in, in the industry going and present, and present a, a design for the system, right? And then the, the, the clients see the number, they go, oh, wow, 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 that's too much. They say, no, 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 don't you worry, I'll come up with another system, another design. And they actually do come up with another design that costs you know, 20% less. And then the client goes, absolutely, this is what I want. But they don't tell them is that by running this system that I designed first and running the system that I designed second, you're going to end up spending three times what you wanted to save in the cost of materials. A good, no engineer is, a good engineer is going to tell you what your return on investment is going to be in the long run. And, you know, if you've got to spend 10,000 more to, to, to get a, a, a more, you know, energy efficient result, um, you, could, you could spend 100,000 more to gain 1% where it's not viable. Yeah. So, you know, you, you just, that's why you need someone that knows how to do the maths to do it, simple. And, um, and that's what I did when I did it. I was you know, quite fortunate to be able to have, have a position to do that and um, it has paid dividends. Um, Emmanuel, Lucci's just had his hand up. Lucci, shall I pop you on so you can ask your question or make your comment? Yeah. All right, one second. Um, all right, Lucci, fire away. Can you hear me now? We can, yes. Yeah, listen, I'd just like to say a great presentation by all. Um, a couple of points, um, and it's just a comment, um, but it, it's the most important thing for anyone is to understand, understand their soils, okay, and what the capacity of their soils is. Moisture monitoring is, is super important. It's only an indication, but it is super important. The other thing also is plants. There are so many different varieties and what a lot of growers, I, I think, fail sometimes is understanding the root zone. It was a point touched on. Um, root zone of plants is so important. So, you know, the old sal uh, the salvers or, or the, the old varieties that only had, you know, maybe 200 mil of uh, 250 mil of root zone, you know, whereas some of these new varieties like Cabrillo and that, they'll go up to 400 mil. So, yeah, they're achieving, you know, they're a much bigger root zone. They're able to obviously source water a lot better and so forth, but they're a bigger plant so forth. So understanding, but I guess the understanding of all those components, your own soil, your own water and so forth. And then the points they made about, you know, design of, of, of irrigation systems. It's so important to get professional people to actually design um, and it, it creates for efficiency. And it's very difficult for a lot of old farms that have been established for a very long time. They were, they were possibly designed when there weren't designers around. So it's, it's hard to make those changes sometimes, but it, it is much more efficient in doing so. But all, all the comments and all the points made were very good. Mm. Thanks, Lucy, for your feedback. Um, all right. If there's no other questions or comments, just check I haven't missed anything in the chat box. No, I haven't. Um, well, Andres, Jeremy, um, and Emmanuel, you're still there. Yes. Thank you so much for your time today. I think it's been, um, you know, a really good insight for um, everyone who's joined. And I know that there's a lot of people that couldn't join today that want to watch the recording. So I will pop the recording um, up on the Berries Australia YouTube channel um, and share it with all our growers. And I know Angela will push it out to um, Berry Growers Australia wide as well. So um, we might include in that email that we send out to people your name, email address or slash website if you're happy with that as well. Absolutely. I was going to say, feel free to give my name and, and put the Irrigation Australia, you know, link to anyone who wants to probably know more about the things yep. that, that are to be known. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah, I think there's definitely some links from both, uh, probably all of your presentations that we could include yeah. in the email. Emmanuel's system, Jeremy's um, link with like Iristat and a couple of the others he was mentioning, um, and definitely back to Irrigation Australia. So yeah, 
Thank you so much for your time. Um, I'll just let everyone know that when you I do end this, there will be a really quick four question survey that will pop up on your screen. If you could just take the 15 seconds to answer it, that would be amazing. Um, and I hope you can all get outside and enjoy the rest of this beautiful Melbourne spring day if you are in Melbourne. <laughs> or, or in, Brisbane, in Brisbane, you can do the same thing. I oh yeah, well in Brisbane, you can do it nearly every day. So we don't want to know about you. <laughs> I'll see you guys here, Jeremy. See you, Emmanuel. See you, everybody else. Um, thank you for the invitation. Thank you very much. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.